practically? How do we actually do it? I started off by suggesting, you may or may not agree with me, that inclusive language doesn't hold a lot of credence out there in parishes and circuits up and down the country. It seems to me that there isn't a lot of energy or interest in it, although there used to be. And what there is uh, does breed quite a lot of irritation. I want to encourage us to be risk takers in our language and remain risk takers. <coughs> to develop our own, what I called earlier, faithful imagination. It seems to me that one of, the, uh, one of the principles we should be encouraging is telling the truth in liturgy. Liturgy simply puts into sacred words what is already true. But it's a brave person who in the intercessions or in a sermon or in a discussion group uh, in a parish is able really to name the shameful parts of scripture. Some of you will be familiar with Phyllis Tribble's book, Texts of Terror, where she, in a scholarly way, tells the stories of the Hebrew scriptures, particularly of women. To be able to tell the story, for example, of Jephthah's daughter, and to face it for what it actually is, and to understand that out of, you, you remember the story, you're nodding, you remember the story, Jephthah promises that if God uh, enables him to win the battle that he is just off to fight, then he will sacrifice the first thing he sees when he returns home. The first thing he sees is his only daughter. And so he uh, says to her that this is what he's going to do. And she says, well, please, can I have some time to go to the desert and to lament? her virginity is what the scriptures say to lament and then after two months uh, she comes back and there's a very interesting uh, line in the story it simply says Jephthah uh, fulfilled his promise to God that that's the line that's her death and so Phyllis Tribble helps us to face those really catastrophic stories um, in her book texts of terror but there are other issues, of course, to name the fact that uh, the system of slavery is assumed throughout the New Testament. To perhaps elucidate the story, of, for example, of the man, uh, the man who lives outside the town, who is in chains by the tombs, the Gerasene uh, demoniac, as he's called in kind of shorthand that Jesus heals that town, <coughs> but perhaps the town needed healing because this man was outside the town. And that there was a, there's a, an argument for saying that a community uh, needs healing if that's what it will do to an individual who is different from the community. So a level of truth-telling or elucidation of biblical texts that enable us to face what they're actually saying and to watch the images that we use. We were talking just earlier in terms of ethnicity. Do not go to default mode in, again, intercessions or discussion or biblical groups or sermons that darkness is bad and that light is good. Use texts from the tradition. Darkness and light are both alike to you. Under the shadow of your wings, shadow is good, shade and darkness is good. And I know June will be saying more about this this afternoon. Daniel, the one who had hair like wool, and remember the significant figures like the Queen of Sheba from Ethiopia. To acknowledge in our liturgy and discuss as normative heroes of the faith who were physically impaired. Moses who stammered, Jacob who limped, Paul whose conversion happened not in the light, but in the darkness for three days before Ananias restored his sight. Theologians of disability have pointed out to us that Jesus became disabled, pinned on the cross. At the heart of the story of salvation is impairment, disability. The story of Bartimaeus. In the early church, it's not the healing of Bartimaeus that's the most important thing in this story. It's that Bartimaeus, by his persistence, is a model disciple. 
Even though he calls out the wrong name to Jesus, it is his persistence and clarity of purpose and his faith, similar to the parable of what's known as the persistent widow, or I like to call it the comatose judge. <laughs> the parable of <laughs> renaming, renaming the stories and understanding by some accessible scholarship how the early church saw those early healing stories. In penitence, we could release Jesus, and this you may or may not uh, agree with, release Jesus from the ossified, as I was saying before, name Lord, always calling Jesus Lord. Kyrie in Greek is of course an ancient prayer of the church. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. Perhaps it's more inclusive to pray it in Greek once we have understood together what it means. Because Lord, to me, has hierarchical connotations. I get visions of Ermin and the House of Lords. That's probably just my own problem. But instead of always saying, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, I will say through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Saviour, our Rock, our Friend. The default position is often Jesus, our Lord. And I want to suggest to those of us who pray extemporary prayers, that we need to challenge ourselves not to be lazy about that. To use for penitence, not all the time of Kyrie eleison, Lord Jesus, but the Trisagion, an equally, uh, an equally um, ancient prayer of the church. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. It's, it's neutral in terms of gender. In the intercessions, instead of, again, the default position, Lord have mercy or Lord hear us, God of life and love, God of peace, God of mercy and truth, God of wisdom and grace, this will all be familiar to you. But to use those, uh, those responses often enough that they become familiar, because one of the things that I feel about inclusive language and pushing uh, the newness of inclusive language is that there is part of us as Christians that value repetition and tradition. We like the fact that we've learned prayers and we've got a knapsack of prayers that we can learn and say uh, either to ourselves or in a, in a small group. The issue is then for us to learn new prayers, for they're not for inclusive language not to mean everyone always looking at the page, but for us as church communities to know that when the intercessor, intercessor says, God of love, hear our prayer, that that's as familiar as Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. So repetition of a few texts, I want to suggest, is more effective than a vast variety of texts in those key moments of our liturgies.